So Hebrews 11 has this uh, short description of Moses' life. And today we're continuing our series called Walking with God. And we're going to look at the story of Moses. But let's just look at it in Hebrews 11 to begin with before we go back to Exodus. And you'll find it in verses 23 through 29. And I'm reading from the English Standard Version. You can read along with me if you'd like. By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hidden for three months by his parents because they saw that the child was beautiful, and they were not afraid of the king's edict. By faith, Moses, when he was grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to be mistreated with the people of God than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. He considered the reproach of Christ greater wealth than the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking to a reward." By faith, he left Egypt, not being afraid of the anger of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. By faith, he kept the Passover and sprinkled the blood so that the destroyer of the firstborn might not touch him. By faith, the people crossed the Red Sea on dry land, but the Egyptians, when they attempted to do the same, were drowned. This story summarizes the big picture of Moses' life from his birth all the way until he leads the people out of Egypt. By faith is the refrain all the way through this chapter in Hebrews 11. By faith, Moses. By faith, Abraham. By faith, Enoch. By faith, by faith, by faith. And I I think, and I'm pretty confident I've got biblical support for this, because Hebrews 11 says that without faith it's impossible to please God. The only way that we can walk with God is by faith. Back in 1995... The Louisiana prison, Angola, the Angola prison, it's a maximum security prison, and they hired a new warden who happened to be a Christian. His name, Warden Kane. Warden is not his first name, but uh, it's his title. I don't know his first name. Warden Kane. And Warden Kane, he came into the prison, and he began to do his duties, and one of the early things that he had to do was preside over an execution of uh, somebody who is on death row. And so the man dies in front of him, and he is faced with the fact that likely that man had never had an opportunity to know Jesus. And he, he felt an overwhelming sense that God had a purpose for him there, that he needed to do something for God to bring hope and to bring salvation to these men of this prison. Angola prison had been one of the bloodiest maximum security prisons in the nation. One of its inmates said, this place was completely hedonistic. It was the survival of the fittest. In 1971, the American Bar Association described the conditions at Angola as medieval, squalid, and horrifying. So, Warden Kane partnered with the New Orleans Baptist Seminary, and he started a Bible class. And he invited anybody who wanted to come, and he especially offered it to the death row inmates. And over the years, that Bible class, it started Bible studies all throughout the, the, um, the prison, and it, be, it grew into a full-fledged Bachelor of Pastoral Ministry seminary degree. And the prison, it it developed all kinds of things along with this Bible study program. They had continuing education. They had vocational training. They had work programs. They they did lots of things. It wasn't just this Bible study, but the Bible study contributed to the the development of 30 um, different congregations on that campus. Over 400 inmates attend church services every weekend. And Somewhere in the range of 30 or so inmates graduate from a bachelor's degree in pastoral ministry every year. And it's not just stopped with Angola because because these, these prisoners have become preachers, other prisons have asked for those prisoners to be transferred to them to start churches in their campuses. In 2013, the state of Louisiana began a rehabilitation program that took a thousand inmates that were ready, just about ready to be released back into the general population of of the United States. And they're in a medium security prison. And they took these thousand prisoners and they put them in Angola, a maximum security prison, to be mentored four at a time by Angola residents. They were called re entry social rehabilitation mentors. They would spend all day 
eat with these guys. They'd go to, to vocational work together. Um, they, they would do training together. And in the evenings, they would do Bible studies together. And then after some period of time at Angola, they were released from prison. Warden Cain believed that God had something special, a big plan for Angola prison, and he made himself available to join God in what God was doing. Could Warden Cain accomplish all of those things? No, but God had a plan. And I'm not saying that Angola prison is, a, is the, the perfect model um, of, uh, of what a prison should be, but let's just say that the transition from the 70s and 80s and 90s to what we see today is night and day. Faith in God, faith in who he is, faith in what he's capable of doing, faith in his plans and his purposes, that's the foundation of every story of walking with God that you'll ever hear. Moses' story of faith begins with the faithfulness of his parents. There was a miraculous deliverance from what would have been otherwise a watery grave of the Nile River. There was years of training in a royal family. Somehow God was orchestrating things out there. There was a murder. That wasn't God's plan. Moses fled from Egypt and for fear of his life. And, and yet, when we look at Moses' story, it's not so much about Moses as it is about God. So I want to explore in the story of Moses' life, specifically the story of him on Mount Horeb, where he's interacting with God at a fiery bush. We're going to explore this story, and we're going to look at seven realities of walking with God, experiencing God's presence. The first reality, I was going to show you a a picture of the prison and forgot. The first reality is that God is always at work to save the world. He's got a big picture plan, and he's doing stuff right now. Whether we see it or not, things are happening. The Israelites were in Egypt for several hundred years, and God was working in their experience. They didn't always know it. Things kept getting worse for them. It was from bad to worse. In fact, the Bible records, nowhere else in the Bible is recorded the kinds of evil that Pharaoh committed on on the Israelites. I mean, he was throwing babies to crocodiles. This is despicable stuff that had never been recorded in the Bible before this time. In Exodus 2, 23 to 25, we read it in our scripture reading. It says, during those many days, the king of Egypt died and the people of Israel groaned because of their slavery and cried out for help. Their situation had gotten so bad. Their cry for rescue from slavery came up to God and God heard their groaning and God remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac and with Jacob. God saw the people of Israel, and God knew. I love that translation, the way it approaches it. God saw, and God knew. This is not the God uh, who, who is, uh, could care less about the world, who's got bigger things to worry about than you and your problems. This is the God who sees, and the God who knows, and the God who cares. This is the creator God. This is the redeemer God who has a plan to save mankind. By the time we pick up Moses' story, 40 years after he fled Egypt, there in chapter 3, verse 1, God has been working. He's been working in all the different plans, the politics of Egypt, the hearts of the people of Israel, and in Moses' heart as well. God finally chose to reveal himself at just the right time, in just the right place for Moses to be able to hear it and to respond so that he could join God in his work of saving his people. I wonder if Moses had thought that his, his potential was used up already. I mean, you think about it. He murdered somebody, fled for his life, and his desire to save Israel from the, the slavery situation they were in seemed hopeless. How could he accomplish that? Maybe he thought that he was done. Maybe he thought... He'd grown accustomed to becoming a shepherd, and he thought that this was the life that he was going to live, and that was, that was the way he was going to end his days. But God saw, and God knew, and God was working to save his people. Regardless of what Moses saw or didn't see in Egypt about how God was working or not, God was still working, which leads us to the next reality, that God pursues a loving relationship That's personal and practical. You can read about it in Exodus 3, verses 1 through 4. One day, Moses was tending the flock of his father Jethro, 
father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian. He led the flock far into the wilderness and came to Sinai, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a blazing fire from the middle of a bush. Moses stared in amazement. Though the bush was engulfed with flames, it did not burn up. This is amazing, Moses said to himself. Why isn't the bush burning up? I must go see. When the Lord saw Moses coming to take a closer look, God called to him from the middle of the bush, Moses, Moses, here I am, Moses replied. I I think it would be a really good Bible study if you were to take this passage and explore the God saw and God knew theme. God saw, God knew, and then Moses is on the mountain and Moses sees something different. And he said, I must go look. I need to figure out what's going on here. I bet you'd find some really interesting things in that theme if you were to study that out. Multiple times in the story of Moses, we find God interacting with Moses and coming down. Like it was, it was the story of, of um, him being rescued from the Nile River with Pharaoh's daughter in the mix. God's divine inter- intervention. There's no way to explain it other than that. Um, God he drew near to Moses in this burning bush. He met with him and spent hours and hours with him, days even, in the tent of meeting up on the mountain. God, he uniquely invested in Moses. He gave him all the resources he needed. He brought people into his life at just the right time, whether it was Pharaoh's daughter or Aaron when he was feeling like he couldn't speak. Uh, Later, he brought Jethro into the mix to help him when he was dealing with a, a difficult leadership crisis. And then even later, he had Joshua being trained up so that he could take Moses' place and and be a support for Joshua. And there was others the Bible mentions. Every story that you read in the Bible is a story of God pursuing somebody. God intervenes in Paul's life through a blinding light and a voice that calls him to know Jesus. God intervened in Isaiah's life while he was there in the temple. He appears and he calls him to be a, a witness and a voice for God to a stubborn and hard of hearing people. God intervened in Gideon's life, appearing to him while he was threshing wheat and calling him to help him deliver Israel from an enemy. Every prophet, every teacher, every elder, every disciple, the women, and even the children in the Bible all have a story of God pursuing them, God seeking them out, God loving them. And John, who spent lots of time with Jesus, he even goes so far to say is that we love period, anybody, that we love because he first loved us. Our response to him begins with his pursuing us. God took the lead in inviting Moses into a personal and dynamic relationship with him. And I think this is the most important factor when we think about a walk with God. Our relationship with God, our love relationship with God is the foundation of everything else. If you're not hearing God speak to you, if you're not experiencing God, then start by asking, have I seen God? Have I known God? I guarantee that God sees you and God knows you. The third reality is that God is inviting us to join him in his work. Forty years before the burning bush, Moses had a big dream. I mean, it was a big idea. He was going to free Israel from captivity, and he started by killing a guard. Did his plan work out? I mean, it was a big dream. It was a bigger than him dream, wasn't it? And yet, and yet it wasn't God's timing. There were things that had to happen, things that needed to be put in place before that could be possible. And, and so his plans failed. But God, even though his plans failed and even though he fled and even though God was kind of in the mix working to to make sure he got to the right place, I mean, he met Jethro and his daughter and he had a place to, to, to be a shepherd for a while and to learn humility. God designed that, but there was no burning fiery bush when he left Egypt. There was no voice coming out from heaven to, to lead him. God was inviting him first to be one of those people that abides with him. God, in the, he, he has big dreams. He doesn't ask us to, be, to dream big dreams. He has big dreams. He's got his whole plan laid out. What he asks us to do is abide with him and let him abide with us. 
Until God reveals himself to us, he, he just needs us to spend time with him, to be in a place in his word and among his people so that he can reveal himself to us in his timing and in his way. And when God reveals to us uh, his plan, where and how he's working and whatnot, that is the time that he's inviting us to join him. And that's the best time to say yes to God, wouldn't you say? Is it a good idea to, to delay? Delay leads us to forget, doesn't it? As I mentioned this morning when we mentioned the idea of prayer partners, uh, delay is not the best idea for action. If you want to take action, now is the time. And if God's got a big plan in mind and he comes down to you in a burning fiery bush or some other way of revealing himself and he says, I've got a plan for you, don't you think that's the right time to say yes? In Moses' story, God's purpose was to rescue the Israelites out of slavery in Egypt and to establish them as a nation in their own land. And God invited Moses to be involved in this work. You can read about it in Exodus 3, verse 7 and following. Then the Lord told him, I have certainly seen the oppression of my people in Egypt. I have heard their cries of distress because of their harsh slave drivers. Yes, I am aware of their suffering. God sees and God knows. So I have come down to rescue them from the power of the Egyptians and lead them out of, the, out of Egypt into their own fertile and spacious land. It's a land flowing with milk and honey, the land where the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites now live. Look, the cry of the people of Israel has reached me, and I have seen how harshly the Egyptians abused them. Now go, for I am sending you to Pharaoh. You must lead my people out of Egypt." I don't think it would have ever crossed Moses' mind that it was a good idea to go back to Pharaoh and to say, let my people go. That was like death penalty guaranteed kind of stuff. There's no way that Moses was going to have this idea on his own. But Moses was being called to join God in a work that he had already been preparing. I I doubt Moses knew that the Pharaoh had died, the Pharaoh that was there when Moses fled. But God had been preparing things. And you see that transition right there at the end of chapter 2 where God says that Pharaoh had died. The people cried out to him. God saw and God knew. The fourth reality is that God speaks to us. And we talked a couple weeks ago when we talked about Elijah, the three ways that God reveals himself. He speaks to us by his Holy Spirit through direct revelation in the Bible, through his providential leading, which includes all the open and closed doors, as well as the interaction of our church family and how he uses other members of the, the church body to influence us and lead us. And he also speaks directly through the voice of the Holy Spirit to our hearts as we pray and seek him. When you hear God speaking to you in his word, I'd like to encourage you to seek the input of other Christians. There's something about the body that God designed to put checks and balances on crazy ideas. You've heard the one, and I might have even said it before here in this church. Somebody opens the Bible, says, Lord, I need a word from you, and, it, and they read this, this passage where it says, and Judas went out and hung himself. You've heard this, right? And they, they say, no, that's not, that can't be God's word. And they flip it over and they find another place in the Bible where it says, go thou and do thou likewise. It's possible for us to come up with bad ideas after reading God's word. And it's really healthy for us to seek the input of our fellow Christians and not just study God's word in a vacuum. And so if you're praying and saying, Lord, should I go? And you open the Bible and it says, go, that's not the time to take all your stuff and sell it and, 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 and set out on some trip. That's the time to go to a friend and say, I've been exploring this. Lord, the Lord seems to be telling me this. What do you think? How do you see it? And a godly advisor can help give context to God's word. God spoke to Moses in a burning bush. Maybe that's not the way he's spoken to you, but he speaks to us and reveals himself in different ways. Here in Exodus 3, verse 4, it says, when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. Then he said, do not come near. Take the sandals off your feet for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. And he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. There's something about the place that Moses was at. Exodus 3.1 tells us that he was on Mount Horeb, the mountain of God. Was he there to worship? 
We don't know why he was there. Maybe he was just shepherding his sheep, but, but he was in the right place. And I would suggest that if we know that God reveals himself through his word, through the providential leading of his spirit, including that of his church family, and through our time with prayer and listening to his Holy Spirit, wouldn't it make sense if we want to hear something from God that we are there where God reveals himself? We're told that we should always be ready and, and interested in being in the place where prayer is wants to be made. It's a good thing to be at the place where people are praying for God to lead. Church service, a small group study, surround yourself with opportunities to be part of God's people. It's also a good idea to spend time on a regular basis in God's Word, whether it's in the morning or at night, regular times. Daniel is said to have prayed three times a day. Three times a day, he dedicated time with God to to talk with him and listen to him. God revealed to Moses his holiness, his mercy, his power, his name. He revealed his purpose to keep his promise to Abraham and to give Israel a promised land. And and I'm sure he revealed many things that aren't described in Exodus chapter 3, because you can only write so much. One thing is certain. When God spoke, Moses knew that this was God. Moses understood what God had said, and Moses knew what to do in response. You ever interact with spiritual things and leave confused? You're not quite sure, was that God's voice speaking to me or was that my own? You're not quite sure what exactly it means for your personal experience. Is this practical for you yet? Well, maybe there's a little more exploration that you need to do until you understand, yes, God is speaking in this way. This is what he wants me to do. And this is, this is how he wants me to respond. God isn't always in the burning bush experience, but God does reveal himself to each one of us. The fifth reality is that God's invitation for you to work with him always leads to a crisis of belief. Don't believe me? (laughs) Think about it. Whenever God reveals his plans, they are are plans with God-sized dimensions. Moses wasn't capable of doing what God asked him to do. Elijah wasn't capable of doing what, he, what God asked him to do. Warden Cain wasn't capable of doing what God had asked him to do. But God still asked them to be a part of God's big picture plan. God doesn't invite you into something that's going to make you look good. He invites you into something that's going to make him look good. And that's going to be an assignment that has eternal consequences. Now, it might be that God calls you to a mundane task, For a time, God had called Moses to be a sheep herder. That may have been a mundane task, but it had eternal consequences because it grew his character in an important way. And even ordinary mundane tasks, when God is involved, have something there that's always eternal and, and has these divine dimensions and implications and possibilities. There's something special when God says, I need you for this. Because God's tasks are God-sized, when God calls you to do something, you'll inevitably experience a crisis of belief. When Moses saw what God wanted him to do, he had some doubts. And they weren't doubts about his own potential, like, am I able to go and talk to Pharaoh? They're they're doubts about whether this is going to work at all, whether God actually knows what he's talking about. You can read about him in Exodus chapter 3, verse 11. Moses protested to God, who am I to appear before Pharaoh? Who am I to lead the people out of Egypt? Or in verse 13, Moses protests again. If I go to the people of Israel and and tell them, the God of your ancestors has sent me to you, they will ask me, what is his name? Then what should I tell him? In verse, uh, chapter 4, verse 1, Moses protests again. What if they won't believe me or listen to me? What if they say, the Lord never appeared to you? And then verse 10 of chapter 4, he says, he pleads. He's, he's protesting. Now he's pleading. Oh, Lord, I'm not very good with words. I've never, I never have been. I'm not now. Even though you've spoken to me, I get tongue-tied. My words get all tangled up. And then one last time in verse 13, he pleads, Lord, please send someone else. When God comes to you and says, I've got a plan for your life, you might not like it. Not just that you might not like it, but you might not be sure it's possible. And you might say, Lord, I, I doubt 
that that's going to work. Moses doubted whether God could accomplish such an enormous task through him, whether the Israelites would believe uh, God had appeared to him, whether he was capable of speaking eloquently enough to convince Pharaoh and the other people of what he said. In each case, Moses' doubt was a doubt of God's ability. And so God responds to Moses' doubts. And I'm comforted by this. God doesn't blast Moses for having doubts. The fact that he struggled in his belief was not a new thought to God. God expected it. And so God did interesting things. He turned a staff into a snake. He he had him put his arm into his cloak and it came out leprous. He put it back in. It came out healed. He he talked to him about the the water terminating blood. And he described these different things that that would happen. And, And Moses began to believe. He began to face his doubts and to take a step in faith. And that step leads us to our sixth reality. I just want you to notice the graph that I'm putting on the screen. It's got God working above. Beyond what we can see, above our, our view, God is working. And, and then God comes down at the right time, in the right place, and interacts with us, creating a love relationship with us, inviting us to be part of him, who, he's, who He is and what He's doing, and speaking to us directly, telling us, this is my plan, and this is how I want you to be involved. God initiates. God starts this process, but there does need to be a response from us. And it might begin with a crisis of belief where we're like, I'm not sure, God, but, but then it, it needs to move. If we're going to really walk with God, then, then it needs to move forward to our adjusting our lives to join God in what he's doing. And that's the sixth reality. When Moses encountered God on the mountain, he could have either rejected God's call and continued to be a a shepherd, or he could have changed his priorities and his life situation to join God in his work. Those were his options. Just stop and think of it rationally for a minute. If God says, I'd like you to join me in my work, it's going to mean moving to Egypt. And you say, you know, I'd rather stay here, God. It's comfortable where I'm at. Are you going to be working with God staying here? No, your choices are saying yes to God and adjusting your life or not following God. Those are your two options when God gives you a call. To get where you are going, I'm sorry, to get from where you are to where God is requires significant adjustments in your life. And they might be adjustments in your thinking. They might be adjustments in your circumstances. They might be adjustments in your relationships or your commitments, your actions or your beliefs. Whatever the situation is, when God faces you with a call, it's going to mean that your life is going to change. To move from your way of thinking or acting to God's way of thinking or acting will always require fundamental adjustments. You can't stay where you are and go with God at the same time. In Moses' case, returning to the court of Pharaoh could have meant that he would have died. But after hearing God describe himself and seeing God turn his staff into a snake and making his hand leprous and heal it again, he had worked through his crisis of belief and he trusted that God could do what God called him to do. And so Moses placed himself at God's disposal, kind of like a servant would to a master, an employee to an employer. When the employer says, I need you to do this, the employee says, I'm right on that. And that's kind of where our lives need to be. If God's truly in charge of me, then he's in charge of my schedule. He's in charge of my house. He's in charge of my money. He's in charge of my relationships. And he gets to tell me what to do. And I should happily adjust my life to where he calls No matter where God wanted Moses to go or to whom he wanted him to speak, Moses was now willing and had ordered his life in such a way that he and his family could follow God's direction, which leads us to our seventh and final reality of experiencing God and walking with him. And that's that when you walk with God, when this this happens, when you obey him, and when you obey God, you get to know him and experience him in a, a deeper way than you would ever have known him before. Let's look back at Moses' story and see how that worked with him. I think that that Moses' story is amazing because as you see every interaction that God has, he's calling Moses to an opportunity of obedience. And Moses says yes over and over and over again. Moses says yes, and over and over and over again, the relationship deepens. Think about it. Um, Until the mountain, Moses was a shepherd who knew about God. 
But after the mountain, Moses was God's mouthpiece, and he sees a nation crumble without a single war campaign. He, he was part of a religious campaign to uncover the fraudulent gods of Egypt. He saw the sea part, water come out of a rock. He received the Ten Commandments from God's own hands. He even ate at God's table. Did you know this? God, Moses ate at God's table, served by angels, as he was going on his way up to spend 40 days on the mountain with God. He actually spent 40 days twice, if I remember correctly. Besides, he hung out with God on this tent of meeting, and he was able to talk with God, and God responded every time he had a crisis in leadership or a question of uh, what to do with his calling, what God had asked him to do. When his life was coming to an end, the Lord gave him a vision of Canaan, not just the Canaan that the Israelites would go to, but the Canaan, the, the new Canaan that God would make. He saw Jesus and, and the, the Messiah. He saw the new earth, and he saw what God's big picture plan was. I'm sure Moses felt humbled and unworthy to be called to walk beside God and to work with him. But when he said yes, he experienced God in real ways that he never would have if he had never said yes to God. Every step of obedience brought Moses and Israel closer to a greater knowledge of God by faith. This theme that keeps repeating in in Hebrews, it's the refrain of Moses' life. His life was one of great accomplishments, but it wasn't because Moses did great things. It was because Moses said, okay, God, and he chose to join God walking in the plan that God had in the great plan of salvation. I want to be one of those people. I want to be one of those people that that is moldable and pliable in God's hands, ready to be used by him for some mundane task with eternal consequences or some great feat that could only be accomplished by God's power. I really don't care. I just want to be walking with God. I want to be God's servant. And in order for that to be a reality, I need to start with my relationship with him. I need my eyes open so that I can see those glimpses that he gives of himself, whether it's a burning bush or a piece of scripture that speaks to my heart. I need to be willing when he opens his, his uh, plans up to me and reveals his, his ideas, I need to be willing and ready to say yes, and, to, and I need to obey God. How about you? Would you like to be molded and shaped by God? It's not always comfortable. Just, just, just making you aware. It's not going to always be easy. It's going to require shifts in priorities. It's going to re- require shifts in your thinking, maybe your activities. You're, you're going to have to open your calendar up to be adjusted by God. Have you ever heard of those people that they've got the calendar, they've got the plan, they're headed somewhere, and God says, I need you to go down that road right now. <laughs> you ever heard of those? I've had a couple experiences like that. It doesn't always happen, but I need my calendar to be open to God, to, for him to adjust it. You might be uh, giving up your family. I guarantee, actually, you'll be giving up your family to be changed by God. You'll be giving your business and vocation to be controlled by God. You'll be submitting your home and your vehicles to be used by God, your talents, your interests, your time, your money, all subject to God's authority. That's what it means to be a servant of God. And that's what it takes to be walking with God. It might not be comfortable, but I guarantee that when eternity comes and you're standing there in heaven with God on the sea of glass, as Revelation 21 describes it, you're not going to be looking back at your life and saying, that was a stupid idea to say yes to God. No, you're going to be looking back and saying, I never made a better decision in my life. That was the best thing I ever did. Can you see what's happened since then? See how God worked here and what God did there and the ways he orchestrated the the path. I would never choose to be led any other way than the way that God has led me. Thank you, God, is what we'll be saying. A friend of mine owns an auto body shop. And one day he was, well, back in the 90s, he he was a, a nominal Christian, loved God, kind of, but not really engaged, if you know what I mean. And he decided he was going to have a daily walk with God. He was going to make time for God to talk to him. And as he did, God began to speak. And God said to him, I want your business. That auto body shop is mine. I want your business. And he said, okay, God. 
and he, he adjusted. He'd poured his life into it. He'd poured his money into it. He'd poured his time into it to the neglect of his family, unfortunately. And he, he gave it to God. And at first, he, he didn't know what that meant because it wasn't just 10% now that he was giving. It was 100% of his business now was God's business. And he was having to look to God as the manager instead of himself. And so he was saying, God, what should I do with this? And, and the first thing he did, he went to his workers and he said, this is God's business now. And they weren't all Christians. And one of the things that he chose to do was give some of the time of his employees to charitable things. He started fixing some people's vehicles for free who needed it. He started to take vehicles that were, were um, wrecked, and he bought them from the insurance company, and he'd repair them, and he gave them to, to people who needed vehicles. And, uh, and then he he started to realize God was in charge. And, and so God told him one day that he needed to pay his workers better. And so he, he began giving more money to his employees and bringing them in on the planning of, the, of, of things. And at one point, they planned a mission trip and they funded a mission trip from their business. Uh, there, there was a time when God said, you haven't been spending time with your children. You need to sell your business. You need to sell my business. And so he did. He sold the business, not really wanting to, but he sold the business. And he took the next couple years and really spent some time with his teenage kids while they were in high school. And then after a couple years had passed, God gave him the business back and he had a little bit more of an idea of how to manage his time. And still today, that business is God's business. And everybody in that business knows this is not just the, the owner's business he re- he's a, an under-manager under God. Where are you in this process? Is God in the process of pursuing a love relationship with you? Do you need to, to take time and be ready for him to, to reveal himself to you? Maybe you're at that place where he's beginning to invite you to join him in his work. He's maybe speaking to you, and you're trying to figure out what, what it's what he's saying, and exactly how that's going to work in your life. How do you need to respond to him? Are you in, a middle, in the middle of a crisis of belief, struggling through, is God capable of doing what it seems he's calling me to do? Or maybe you're facing the adjustment, adjustments necessary in order to follow God. Wherever you are in this process, I'd like to invite you to make the best decision of your life and say yes to God. Would you do that today? Let's pray together. Lord, we are here and we want to surrender ourselves to you. It may be that that some of us are just at the threshold where you're beginning a walk with us. You're beginning to reveal yourself to us. And I I pray that you would that that you would make that clear, that you would help us to see your love. That we would have no doubt that you exist and that you are powerful and that you are wonderful and that you've got plans for us. It may be that some of us are right there in the middle of a crisis of belief. Lord, show yourself to us. Help us to understand that you're capable. Be merciful to us and patient with us, Lord. And there's some of us, Lord, that are in the place where we need to either adjust our lives to walk with you or we need to to recognize that we're not interested in you anymore. And Lord, I pray that you would give us faith to say yes and to be obedient. Lord, we give our lives to you today. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.